In the 14th century, the great stones of Avebury were toppled by villagers acting upon instruction from the church. As legend goes, this angered the gods who cast vengeance upon them. Years later, a group of archaeologists rediscovered the stones along with a body whose grinning skull leered out of the earth at them. Welcome back to Folklore with me, Tamsin Rooney. If this is the first time you're hearing me, let me fill you in on what's going on. A few months ago, I received a box of old cassette tapes from the 80s, which were recorded by my late university professor, Henry Neal. I discovered that each tape contained fascinating research into the world of folklore in and around Wiltshire, the county I grew up in. Last week, I was looking into the reported sightings of the terrifying Black Shuck when I uncovered something even more mysterious. Some ancient runic milestones mentioned in Neil's tape seem to have gone missing between his investigation and mine, and every lead on their whereabouts was a dead end. My frustration over this, paired with my unease about what I thought I saw in my garden, had this mystery playing over and over in my mind. I was grateful then to hear Neil's next tape, which detailed a story about a skeleton in the small town of Avebury, a historical site known for its ancient standing stones. Henry Neal, 18th of April, 1980. It's approximately 9.15 in the AM. I've just had a rather interesting phone call from an historian, Dr Hardy. He is happy to speak with me about the stones. During my preliminary research, I found some interesting things about Avebury. And I'll admit, the place certainly does capture my attention. Especially the strange story of the body of a barber surgeon, which I must say I do find very fascinating. I was going to leave it to the end of the day, but since this historian is based there, I think now it must be the perfect opportunity to put on that particular thread. I was excited too. I spent a fair amount of my childhood in Avebury, growing up not too far from there, and the place has always had a sort of peaceful quality about it. Moreover, I was keen to learn about these phantom stones Neil had been so interested in during the Black Shuck investigation. Um, would you mind just stating your name for my notes? Mm, Of course, of course. Uh, Dr Vincent Hardy, Professor of Archaeology and History. Is that all right? Brilliant, thank you. That's very professional. (laughs) (laughs) What, what, the the tape? Yes, yes, I I should get one. It it just saves on time. I mean, it's it's easier than taking notes, you see. Mmm, it'll certainly make future historians' jobs a lot easier. (laughs) Uh, So, Henry, what was it you wanted to ask me? Well, I, I had a couple of questions, actually. The first is, um, well, I came across these th- stones, two of them, in fact, in different villages, and they had symbols on them, like this. But they were miles apart, and I, I just wondered if you knew anything about them or what they could be. I, I, I've never encountered them before. Well, um, I don't recognise the symbol, th- though it isn't unusual to find carvings in stones. How big were they? It's small. I mean, just like a milestone or a marker stone. Hmm. Well, I haven't personally come across anything like that, but as I said, it isn't unusual to find carvings in stones. Across history, people put them there for all sorts of reasons, and these aisles are filled to the brim with that kind of ancient and fascinating stuff. Take this place, these stones. Look at them. The largest megalithic stone circle in the world, and you're standing 
head in the center of it. And even now, years after discovery, we still don't really understand the sequence of construction. They're fantastic. What were they for? But really, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, we can suggest maybe they were some kind of a, of a theatre. It, it's a good guess, based on the impression the landscape gives us. In that case, they would have been used for ceremonies, possibly with regards to their relationship with their gods, with the landscape, with the earth. Uh, the truth is, we don't really know. Uh, people want you to say they were for sacrificial rituals. Uh, they could have been, but it's unlikely. Well, that's what the people of the Middle Ages thought, though. I mean, that's when the barber surgeon was from. Hmm. Yes, well, I mean, that is interesting. Yes, they dated him by the coins they found with him. They were 14th century, I believe, which could be seen as technically the end of the Middle Ages, if you want to be pedantic about it. So, who was he? Well, <laughs> that's another good question. He was a barber surgeon, if the tools found with him were anything to go by. The most likely theory is that he was travelling. Uh, barber surgeons tended to serve in battles. They'd They'd pull teeth, amputate limbs, drain blood, all grisly medieval forms of surgery, I'm sure. I think perhaps it's that element that draws people to the more macabre nature of it. The, the truth is a lot less interesting than devil worship and blood sacrifices, I'm afraid. Likely he was travelling and he just happened to be helping with the burying of the stones when it fell on him. But, um, why would they leave him? Well, uh, no doubt they simply couldn't do anything but leave him. As I said, the stones aren't small, and we don't really know how they got them there in the first place. I doubt they had the capabilities to lift them. Even in the 30s, when Keeler embarked on his quest to unearth it all, it was a difficult and expensive job. So that's Alexander Keeler, the archaeologist. Yes, fascinating fellow. Businessman, philanthropist, archaeologist, pioneer of aerial photography, uh, <laughs> heir to a marmalade factory. <laughs> oh, always makes me laugh, that one. <laughs> uh, that's what we say of Avery, you know, the, the henge the marmalade build. <laughs> I know that some people say they've seen the ghost of the barber surgeon. Do you put any stock in anything like that? <sighs> no, you're, you're asking me to, to speculate on whether or not ghosts exist. I know why you, you have to to It was at that point my tape player ate the cassette, chewing it up and spitting out streams of black tape right before my eyes. I was distraught. And even when I tried to reel it back in using a pencil, it refused to play anymore. Cut off at a crucial moment, I decided to head to Avebury anyway, if not to retrace Neil's steps exactly, then perhaps just to feel like I was momentarily in his shoes again. I'll admit, I would have skipped over this one entirely in any other circumstance, but that mention of marmalade had me intrigued. Of course, it's worth reminding you all now of that peculiar snippet I discovered on the very first tape. We now know, of course, that Eugenia was potentially the lost widow of Major Fitzroy Playdell Goddard, the last of the Lords of the Manor in Swindon. But here, rather suddenly, we had another hint to a potential answer to this mystery. Marmalade. Were the Goddards somehow linked to Alexander Keeler and Avebury? My research gave me nothing, and I knew it was probably a coincidence, but two mentions of the Orange Preserve in two separate tapes? It seemed so unlikely that I needed to know more. Before I went to Avebury itself, I tried to locate the historian that Neil interviewed. Unfortunately, this man passed away several years ago, which, while being sad, is also very frustrating. He was my only lead on this investigation, and suddenly I was back to square one. However, 
I knew that Avebury was also home to the Keeler Museum, as well as other sites that may be populated with people who know their history. I figured I might be able to find something, even if it wasn't anything with much authority. To my dismay, the museums were all shut due to the pandemic, so the best I could manage was wandering around the other locations in town to try and find local people to talk to. I was fortunate enough to bump into a woman by the name of Emma, who knew all about the local folklore and was up for a chat, even if it was just to pass the time. You said you've had some experiences here in the past. Are there any that stand out to you? Well, they all do in their own way. After a while, it kind of just becomes, well, expected, shall we say. Like you get used to it? Precisely. It happens so often. Beautiful singing. Sorry, singing? Yes, dear. You hear singing. In the stones, I mean. You mean you hear people singing? <laughs> no, no, no. It's not people, dear. It's not people. It's... it's them. Them? The guardians. What do you mean? Those that watch over the stones, if you like. They protect them. You mean like ghosts? Well, I suppose you could call them that. That's not what I'd call them, mind. I'd say they're more like spirits. Well, what's the difference? I'd say a ghost used to be a person. And a spirit? A spirit is something else. I suppose the best way to describe them would be that they look like children, but they're more like the shadow of a child. They don't have a sort of a full form. They're spirits. They're not of this world. Right. What do they sing? It's not a song. It's more like... I suppose a better way to put it would be to say that they make music. Oh, so they play instruments? <laughs> no, dear. Not like that. They just sort of maybe whistle or, or hum. Oh, it's hard to describe, but it's beautiful. You've got to respect the mind and the stones. OK, and what happens if you don't respect them? Well... There have been many a bizarre accident round here, let's just say. Broken legs, trips and falls, that sort of thing. You disrespect the stones and then the spirits come for you. That's what they say. I know a story about a man a while back now, I believe. Perhaps 64, 65. He was camping out on the hill over there. He'd had a bit too much to drink and was making his way down through the stones with his lady friend. And they, uh, well... You know. Oh, right. As the story goes, they got back to their tent, but in the night they could hear noises coming from out here. The singing? Maybe. The man goes off to investigate, leaving his lady friend in the tent. By the time the sun comes up, he's still not back. So of course she goes to have a look. But you can't find him anywhere. That's strange. That's not it, dear. They do find him, eventually. Where did they find him? Two towns over, in a farmer's field. And he'd hung himself. Oh, that is creepy. Indeed. That's why they say don't disrespect the stones. They were put there to honour the spirits and the spirits protect them. Our ancestors used to make sacrifices to them, of course. Like the barber surgeon killed to appease the spirits. That's why they put him there, and I'd be willing to bet he wasn't the only one. Spooky. You don't believe me. I can tell that. I have evidence if you'd like to be more convinced. Evidence of the barber surgeon? No, of the singing. I recorded it once. You can have a listen. Now, we're on episode three of Folklore, so you should have some idea of the way I think by now. And if you do, you'll more than likely have figured out what I think of that blood sacrifice story. One thing I'm struggling to explain, however, is her recording. Shortly after my interview with Emma, she emailed it to me. It was a video, shot on her phone late at night. The quality was poor and the camera work unprofessional, 
but I could just make out the shape of the stones in the darkness. If one was so inclined, it wouldn't be difficult to choose to see shapes moving about in the shadows, but the video itself was so pixelated and difficult to make out, I honestly can't say that it was undeniable evidence. Perhaps the most inexplicable thing to come from it, though, was the sound. Emma had described it as singing or music. That's not the word I choose to use. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure how I would describe it. I'll play it for you here now, and I'll leave you to make up your own mind. Now I'm sure you have your own opinion. Personally, while I don't want to accuse Emma of any fakery, I know there are ways of creating this. Still, watching it back when I arrived home later that evening spooked me, and along with the memory of that strange presence I felt in my garden, Emma's video was enough to give me a sleepless night. While we were talking, Emma suggested I try and find a man named Rob, who would likely be in the Red Lion pub because, as she put it, he would have plenty more to add to my investigation. They cover it up, that's the problem. They use the crop circles and whatnot to throw people off the scent, but it's all to do with the elites. They sacrifice people out there, and that's how they keep their power. They turn the power of the stones into a sort of network. That's how they keep people under their control. What do you mean? <laughs> you think they just invented Wi-Fi? 5G? That sort of stuff? Don't be silly. It's all from the ancient gods out there in the stones. That's why they keep people off of it too. At least off of Stonehenge. But that's what the real powerful one is. You've got to watch out who you're talking to about this stuff, because they've come after you for it. Right. And do you have any evidence? Evidence? It's all online, sweetheart. You can look it up. You just got to open your eyes, stop believing what the fake news media keep telling you. Well... If my chat with Emma wasn't unbelievable enough, I was doubly dismayed to come face to face with a conspiracy theorist. I was feeling utterly defeated and was about to head back to my car and leave Avebury empty handed when an email pinged through on my phone. Before heading out to Avebury, I had sent over some emails to some people I'd managed to find online, in the hopes that one of them might have known Dr Hardy, the historian from Neil's Tape. Most of them hadn't, but this one, a Dr Matthew Reeves, did. What's more, he was willing to speak with me. Excitedly, I dialed the number at the bottom of the email, eager to finally get back on track. Dr. Matthew Reeves, PhD. Who's calling, please? Hi, this is Tamsin Wheatley. We've spoken over email. Oh, hello. Yes, I was expecting you call. How are you? I'm good, thanks. You are... You said you'd be happy to talk, and I wondered if you were free sometime soon so I could ask you some questions. Actually, I'm free now. Uh, where are you situated? I'm in Avebury at the moment, but I was just about to head home. Uh, no need. I'm based in Avebury. Uh, why don't you pop over and we can have a proper chat? I have some papers I think you might be interested in anyway. Now, I know I probably shouldn't have, venturing off to meet a stranger on my own at his house, no less, in the middle of a pandemic, but I was excited. Filled with anticipation, I let my friends know where I was going and set off. Don't worry, I followed all the rules, wore a mask and maintained social distance. It didn't take me long to find the old cottage, nestled in a small copse of trees. Dr Reeves answered the door himself with a smile on his face. His hair was unkempt, but not so much that I'd call him dishevelled. More so that he'd had a busy day with his books and hadn't looked in a mirror. He invited me in and led me to his study, which was cluttered in a sort of cosy, academic way. Floor-to-ceiling bookshelves lined one wall and a collection of certificates and photographs lined the other. While Dr. Reeves went to make himself some tea, I inspected the pictures. My eyes were drawn to one picture in particular. A small stone on what seemed to be the side of the road. There was a symbol carved into it, different from the ones on Neil's stones and yet remarkably similar somehow. 
It had the same sort of zigzags around the edges, although inside looked more like an S with a 7 at the bottom of it. I discreetly snapped a photo on my phone. I'm not sure why I felt the need to be secretive, but I did. So, you wanted to speak to me about Dr Hardy? Well, Neil was investigating folklore for a book, and and I think he met with Dr Hardy to discuss the barber surgeon, I think. Oh, yes. That old thing. Lots of stories around about that. I've heard some. But, um, initially, the meeting was set up to talk about these marker stones that Neil had discovered. They had these odd carvings on the face, and, well, to be honest, it sort of reminds me of that one there in your photo. Oh, right. Yes, well, there's lots of them about. Very interesting. Well, the ones Neil was interested in seem to have just vanished. I spoke to the museums and the council, but no one seems to have any record of them. The trouble with these old things is that they're dotted about all over the place, so realistically anyone could just take one and no one would be any the wiser. It would require some work to move one, though, surely? Of course, but it's not outside the realms of possibility. This is the picture Neil drew of the carving. Do you recognise it? Uh, I don't recognise it, no. But it certainly does appear to be similar, you're right. Do you know what they are? Well, I can't speak for your professor's stones, but the one in my picture there is what they call a guardian stone. A guardian stone? Yes, well, that's what I've called them. Traditionally, guardian stones are found in Scandinavia or Germany, but those tend to be large and they form the corners of rectangular or trapezoid-shaped enclosures. These ones are obviously a lot smaller, and they're not in the corners of any structure. At least, they don't appear to be. Well, what are they for, then? (laughs) Well, now, that is up for debate. (laughs) Right. Most likely they were a form of marker stone used to signify directions or perhaps distance. Sort of in the way we might choose a road sign. But uh, I always quite like the more mystical theories. The obvious one is that they were used to keep evil spirits at bay. Perhaps attract them and then trap them there. Like a black shark? (laughs) Yes, I suppose. Of course, this is pure speculation, and it's based on very little evidence. We're not even sure what those symbols are, let alone who put them there or why. Lots of them are hidden beneath the earth now anyway, I'm sure. There could be hundreds, there could be five. It's a hobby of mine. No one else seems to really care. That's a shame. Well, unfortunately, prehistory doesn't tend to grab the public attention. Therefore, it's low down on the funding priority list. They're building a bypass through Stonehenge now and no one cares. Unless we're talking about the Second World War, for many people, Britain's history may as well be non-existent. Not that I'm bitter. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. The other thing I really wanted to ask about was uh, Alexander Keeler. I spoke to a couple of the locals here and they mentioned he had an interest in witchcraft and such. Do you know anything about that? (laughs) These sorts of things always tend to crop up around people like Keeler. The general public seem to struggle to separate fact from fiction when it comes to folklore. I mean, undoubtedly he was interested in the occult, but that's sort of where it ends. It's not proof that he was gallivanting about performing ritual sacrifices. Do you think there's any truth in the theory that the barber surgeon itself was some kind of sacrifice? (laughs) Well, Keeler certainly didn't think so. Which sort of lays the whole occult thing to rest. I suppose these are the sorts of stories people come to your podcast for. (laughs) People do find it interesting. History is interesting. Fiction is fiction. Fun, but it isn't true. I knew Dr. Reeves was right. Relying on evidence was the way to go. But my gut told me that there was a connection between Eugenia Goddard and Alexander Keeler. What that was, I don't know. I want to theorise for a moment, because after I left Dr. Reeves' home, my mind was racing. Was this really something worth pursuing? 
Or was I projecting an importance in the hope that I might uncover something exciting about my old professor? To me, in the clip, Neil sounds nervous or maybe even frightened, but it had been suggested by others to whom I played the clip that he merely sounds bored. I was worried. Was I letting my imagination run wild? The presence felt in my garden and my sleepless night after watching Emma's video suggested that perhaps I was. Maybe the three months of lockdown coupled with weeks of social distancing and continued isolation was also starting to get to me. Even while talking with Dr. Reeves, we wore masks and stayed apart, and I was longing for some kind of normality. Could it be then that I was creating a mystery by way of a distraction? Guardian stones, marmalade, a lost widow, and a mysterious skeleton buried beneath the earth. None of these things seemed to add up, but I wasn't ready to throw in the towel just yet. I wanted it to make sense, and my gut feeling was that if I kept pressing forward, somehow it would. As it happened, my next lead fell straight into my lap. The following morning, when I checked my emails, I found a message from a fan of the show who was eager to talk with me about all things Keela. She left me her Skype address, so, feeling oddly nervous but excited, I gave her a call. So, uh, Flo, you've said a couple of times now that you're really interested in Alexander Keela and stuff, and I just wondered where that sort of begins. Are you an academic, or is it just a hobby? Well, I suppose you could call it a hobby. I was trying to write a book on him several years ago. It never really panned out because I couldn't find a publisher. But I've always been interested by folklore and Avebury and the history of this country. So Keeler was sort of a natural progression of that. When I was younger, I was really interested in witchcraft and the occult. And I read everything I could get my hands on about the subject. And Keeler would occasionally pop up there as well. So I suppose it was a sort of crossover of interest that led me to become really interested in him. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, he was a curious guy, really. Lots of rumours about him, and you have to try and sort of untangle the fact from the fiction as best you can. So I've heard. I've spoken to a couple of people now who have made suggestions around his more... secret interests. We all know about the excavations, but what about his interest in witchcraft and the occult? Oh, he was absolutely interested in all of that, 100%. Well, in my opinion, anyway. He collected books on it. I think you'd have to be pretty naive to believe that he didn't have at least some kind of engagement with it. You don't do that sort of thing unless you're really interested in it. I mean, take your podcast, for example. You wouldn't really be doing it at all if you weren't also personally interested and involved all these things, right? Hmm. There are also the letters. The letters? Keela wrote letters, hundreds of them. He was a very meticulous and organised person. He also kept diaries and journals, some of which have never been discovered, lost to the world, hidden away in someone's attic or some ancient library collection somewhere. Lots of the letters are kept at the Alexander Keeler Museum, of course, and you can go and see them. Some at the National Archives and some... Well, some are just lying around in the strangest of places. Keeler was a mysterious guy. Several of the letters make reference to the occult practices. Some of them to gatherings. Just like sort of parlour games, you understand. Nothing genuinely supernatural, but they were all into it. And not just Keeler either. Lots of prominent people from the area would attend. Landowners, lords, ladies, business moguls. The Goddards? From Swindon? Could very well have been, yeah. Now, that was interesting. While the investigation this week had left me feeling somewhat dissatisfied, I'll admit I felt like I made some progress with my own personal mystery. While my evidence was by no means undeniable, it wasn't too much of a stretch to place the Goddards in amongst Keeler and his occult practices. What's more, the timelines added up meaning that things had finally started to feel as if they were falling into place. Of course, I was still no closer, really, to understanding what Neil's interest in this was, nor had I settled the matter of the peculiar missing guardian stones, as Dr. Reeves called them. Still, I felt pleased with myself. At least I was justified in suspecting some sort of a connection. I spent the rest of my day taking part in some well-earned me-time. All in all, it was a pretty good day. That was until it was time to go to bed. It must have been around 11 o'clock. I switched the lights off and went to the kitchen to get myself a glass of water. My sink is placed in front of the window that overlooks my garden, so as I filled up my glass, I looked out. And that was when I saw it. Or rather, I saw them. A figure, 
standing in the garden looking up at me. Whereas before it had been more of a presence, this time I could make out the outline. Arms, legs, a head, and a slight glint in the face as the moonlight bounced from their eyes. Needless to say, I jumped at the sight of them. I dropped my glass to the floor and it shattered into a hundred different pieces. When I had finally regained some composure, I peered out again, but they were gone. I called the police and they came to investigate, but found no sign. They suggested I lock my doors and try not to worry, but of course it was too late for that. The worry had already started to fester and my imagination was doing its thing. The next morning I went to have a look for myself and while I can't be sure, I could have sworn I saw footprints in the mud. I'm certainly not suggesting there was anything supernatural to it, but I wanted to mention it nonetheless. At least this way, you'll have an understanding of how my investigations were beginning to affect my view of the world. I wondered if the creepy stories and lingering questions had affected Neil in the same way. I was still unsure why I'd even been sent these tapes, and as far as I could tell, there was no one I could contact to find out. I knew I wanted to keep going, though. I felt like I was close to something. I just didn't know what. Of course, if I had, then I might not have carried on in the first place. Thank you for exploring this mystery with me, Tamsin Wheatley. You've been listening to Folklore. To get in touch and share your thoughts, please search at folklore underscore pod on Twitter or find our official Facebook page. If you've enjoyed the show, please like, share and subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us to help us reach even more listeners. You can also join in the discussion over on our official Folklore Facebook group. Or you can support the show and help make magic happen over on Patreon. And in exchange, you'll get access to all kinds of exclusive content, including some behind-the-scenes snippets, bonus stories and extra interviews. Join me again next episode as I continue to delve further into Neil's tapes and explore the mysteries surrounding the terrifying tale of Sally in the Woods. Black shook cows as the magic takes hold. We will spell into the land as you cast a circle round, fall upon the sixth.